Okay, so uh, Glaucon finishes his speech. Socrates says he's about to say something in response. Adeimantus breaks in and basically says, uh, Socrates, you don't think that that was uh, <coughs> adequately said, do you? Socrates says, well, it sounded pretty good to me. Adeimantus says, well, no, what, what really needs to be said hasn't even been said yet. And Socrates says, okay, so then, you know, as he puts it, as the saying goes, let a man stand by his brother, let's hear what you have to say. And Adeimantus begins his speech, and he, be and he begins by saying, you know, the, the real issue here, Glaucon talked about uh, the arguments against justice, but if we really want to understand what the problem is, we have to look at what the arguments in favor of justice are. We have to look at not the, not the arguments that someone like Glaucon or, or Thrasynicus or, or whoever might make against justice, but we have to look at what the arguments are that people present in favor of justice. As he puts it, fathers tell their children, anyone who's given charge over someone young, over someone impressionable, they always tell them, be just. You should be just. You should be a good person. And Addy Mantis says, that's what we have to look at. If we really want to see the problem, we have to look at what people are saying in favor of justice. Because he says, really, the arguments in favor of justice look an awful lot like the arguments against justice. And he says, in particular, you know, throughout his speech, he, like Glaucon, focuses on the, the, the distinction between the reality of justice or, or, or the actual... Uh, existence of justice or the possession of justice in the soul of the just person and the appearance of it and, and the benefits that come from the appearance, uh, the benefits that come from having a good reputation. So he says, you know, fathers tell their children to be just, but what they focus on is not that justice is good for its own sake, but he says if you're just, you know, what, what they tell their children is if you're just, you'll have a, a good reputation. If you have a good reputation, you'll, you'll rule in the city, you'll get offices, you'll be able to marry who you want. No one wants their children to marry people they think are unjust. So he says, you know, it's like Glaucon said, that, that people practice justice just for the sake of the consequences, just for the sake of the reputation and the good things that come from the reputation. And Andy Mantis says, that's the problem. We not only don't present justice as something good, but he says, if we look at the actual poetic tradition, if we look at our sort of, you know, moral and religious authorities in Greece, as he puts it, the noble Hesiod and Homer, uh, we see that they are actually, they're the ones who are saying that justice is so difficult. And that, that you know, that, that justice is difficult, and the only reason to do it is because the gods reward it. And he says some of the lesser poets, like, like Musaeus, actually, you know, they, they tell of even headier goods, as he puts it. They say that if you're just during your life, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's drudgery, it's, it's, it's not fun. But when you die, you're rewarded in Hades. And how are you rewarded? You're taken down there and, and you're, you're, giving a, you're given a sort of eternal drinking party. So he says, you know, they, they present it as, the, as if the, 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 the best wages for justice is, as he puts it, an eternal drunk, just, just being drunk for all of eternity. Uh, very few people would equate being just with being drunk. So clearly, you know, the idea here is justice is clearly not its own reward. The reward is not being just in, in, in the afterlife for eternity. The reward is a very sort of intense but somewhat crude physical pleasure, the pleasure of drunkenness. Adeimantus says, that's the problem. We, we, you know, all the poets present justice as so difficult, but the gods at least reward it. And, but, but you don't do it because justice is good. You do it because the gods reward it, because of the goods that come from reputation, uh, because of the goods maybe that come in the afterlife. Uh, and he says, but, but actually, the more that we look at religion, we see difficult, problematic things. He talks about these, uh, these uh, uh, wandering beggar priests who go around and say that they have the power to influence the gods, and if you just pay them the right amount of money, they will sort of cast a spell. They'll, they'll sort of get the, turn the gods against one of your enemies, regardless of whether or not that person is just or unjust. Uh, he talks about the initiations, the idea, again, that you can basically pay the gods off, that, that, that if you make the right sacrifices, if you perform the right ceremonies, uh, things can be done, that the gods can be persuaded to overlook your injustice. So Adeimantus, much like Glaucon, says, you know, a big part of the problem here is when people try to praise justice, they don't praise justice itself, they praise the, the good consequences of it the consequences that come from favor with the gods, the consequences that come from having a good reputation and, and the things that that can get you in, in, in society, in the city. Uh, and he says, and that's, that's part of the issue, is they present justice as something not choice-worthy for its own sake, something that is actually difficult and unpleasant, but something that has good consequences. And Adi Mantis says, if people take that to heart, it only makes sense that they would then turn around and say, well, is there a way to get these good consequences, the good reputation, without actually being just? And if there is, clearly that's what we should do. Being happy, as he puts it, you know, we have to follow the tracks of the argument. And if the argument tells us that, that happiness comes simply from the reputation for justice, not for justice itself, and in fact, that, that, that simply having the reputation without all the hard work of justice, all the drudgery, all the unpleasantness, if we could just get the reputation and, and, and the good consequences while setting aside all of the unpleasantness of actually being just, Adam Ange says, according to this argument, clearly that's what we would try to do. And he goes through this kind of, you know, interesting uh, times, kind of almost kind of humorous 
uh, dialogue back and forth between someone where he says, well, that, that's what we have to do then. We have to sometimes uh, persuade people, sometimes use you know, fraud or, or, or persuasion, other, other times maybe use force. And, and, and be unjust, but but at the same time, you know, keep up the keep up the appearance of being just, so that we get those those benefits of a good reputation. And someone comes back and says, "It's not going to be easy always to fool everybody like that." And and Adi Mantis says, "Well, we'll, we'll respond. Nothing great is easy." And again, uh, this is where he says, if, "If the tracks of the argument lead in this way, we have to follow them. We have to say what will really make us happy. If it's this, if it's if it's pretending to be just while actually being." crafty and, and, and wily like a fox and, and fooling everybody to get that to get that good consequence uh, to get the good that comes from the reputation of justice while at the same time being unjust he says if that's what the argument says will make us happy that's what we have to do and if it's difficult it's difficult we'll figure out a way and in his his sort of imagined inter interlocutor comes back and says well but, 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 but what about the gods you, you can't overpower them and, and Adi Mantis replies and he says well first of all if there are no gods then obviously we don't need to worry about that and secondly, he says, uh, if there are no gods, or if there are gods, but, but they don't care about human beings. So this, this is one possibility, that maybe there are gods, maybe there are beings who are greater than human beings, higher than human beings, but they don't care if, if somebody out there is stealing or even killing. So maybe there are gods, but they don't really care what human beings are doing. They're not paying much attention to individual human beings. They're not punishing and rewarding people. So Adimanta says, if there are no gods, or if there are gods, but they're such as don't care about human beings, then we don't need to worry about that. And he says, but even if there are gods, everything that we know about them comes from the poets. And the poets are the ones who are telling us that they can basically be bought off. So he says, you know, if, if there are gods and, and, and if, if they are such as the poets say they are, and again, what else would we believe about them? We don't have any other sources of information about them. So if there are gods, but they're such as the poets say that they care about people, well, they can also be persuaded by, they can also be influenced by, by, uh, by sacrifices. So in that case, again, if we're unjust and therefore we have the means to make good sacrifices, then, then we can basically buy the gods off. We can, we can have favor with the gods even if we've been unjust. As long as we make the sacrifices to them, they'll be happy. And as long as we are, are initiated in, into the right uh, uh, religious rites and so on, then, then, then we'll be okay in the afterlife as well. So he says, you know, again, it's, it's Greek religion that actually says we can do all of these things and not have to worry about it. So then he steps back and again, he says, you know, look, this isn't my argument. So he steps back and he says, someone who sees all of this and, and, and who understands what's going on, as he puts it, uh, that they'll realize that only if someone has, as he puts it, a divine nature, only if they somehow just can't stand doing injustice, will they be just. And he says, someone who knows this, someone who actually uh, doesn't want to be just because, as he puts it, they have adequate knowledge. Uh, would simply have pity for, for people who are being unjust because he would see that actually justice is good but people just don't know that. I know it, I can see it, other people can't. So they're making bad decisions for themselves. But he says you wouldn't be angry about this, you would feel pity for them. So he sounds very Socratic here. You know, someone who has, who has adequate knowledge, who knows that justice is good, would choose justice and then would look at those who choose injustice and simply feel pity. Because again, as, as Annie Mantis put it, puts it, they've been poorly educated. They've been told certain things about justice, they've taken those things to heart, and now they're acting on them. Again, they, they've been told that justice itself is difficult and unpleasant, the rewards of justice are, are, are good and pleasant, therefore get the rewards if you can without the difficulty, and, and that's what people are trying to do. Uh, and so, uh, so basically he sort of goes on and he continues to make this type of argument. Then at the end he says, um, at 367e, or, or basically towards the end of his speech, he comes back to Glaucon's idea, he says, Socrates, praise justice and injustice by themselves. Don't praise the reputation, take the reputation away. He even says, take the, take the true reputation from each and switch it, you know, give, give each person the false reputation like Glaucon had said, but his version is not nearly as dramatic as Glaucon's, the, the just person isn't being tortured to death like, like Glaucon sort of spelled, you know, sort of, uh, you know, discussed in some detail, uh, Adi Mantis just says, you know, take the reputation away, the seeming, the, repu the, the reputation, all of that has to be taken away so that we can see that justice itself is really good. Show us that. Convince us that justice is actually good on the person's soul, not, 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 not for the consequences, but for the actual justice itself, for actually being just is good for you. Uh, and so he comes back to this and then in, in he, he sort of spells it out. Uh, at uh, 367C, he says, Now, since you agreed that justice is among the greatest goods, those that are worth having for what comes from them, but much more for themselves, such as seeing, hearing, thinking, and, of course, being healthy, and all the other goods that are fruitful by their nature and not by opinion. So he says, you know, again, Socrates, you're the one who said this. You're the one who said justice is good for its own sake and good for what comes out of it. As he puts it, like seeing, like hearing, thinking, 
And he says, of course, being healthy, you know, you're the one who said it was like, so show us this. Show us how justice, like health, is good for its own sake. Uh, no one is actually arguing that somehow being sick is better than being healthy. Uh, so, so show us that justice is the same way, that, 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 that nobody, would, nobody and no one who really knows, no one in their right mind would argue that being unjust is better than being just. And again, he says, you know, this is a, this is a question of it being this way by nature. So, I mean, it's interesting because here Adi Mantis kind of has recourse to nature, like Glaucon. He says, you know, show us that justice is actually good by nature. Uh, but, but his version is kind of odd because in that case, if justice is really good by nature, uh, then, then people have been somehow educated to just ignore nature. That, that although he appeal, although Adi Mantis appeals to nature here, his view of nature seems to be very weak, that it's very easy to simply educate people in the opposite direction. Uh, to convince them that actually justice, that, that if you tell people the wrong thing about justice, they won't be able to see that it's good. Glaucon's argument was, was much stronger. Again, this wasn't his own view, but the way that he presented it was much stronger. He said, you know, let's, the, the argument would be that injustice is naturally good, and that's why people are unjust, because that's what's naturally good. It's justice that tries to fight that, but really can't. For the most part, it, it's, 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 uh, you can con you, it, it's successful in compelling people to obey the law, for the most part, the law is successful in, in coercing people and using violence uh, to getting them to, for, in order to get them to be just. Uh, so, so the the law can be successful in compelling people using force, but it doesn't persuade every, it doesn't persuade anybody. Everyone is still walking around thinking, if I could get away with it, I would be just. If you gave somebody the, the invisible ring, they would instantly go out and be unjust because although the law can coerce them or compel them to act according to the law for fear of punishment, it can't actually convince them that what is natural is unnatural. Uh, so Glaucon's argument was, you know, injustice is naturally good, the law can force you to, to, to act against that, but it can't actually trick you, it can't actually fool you or make you think that something that is naturally good is naturally bad. Adi Mantis seems to be saying that that is possible, that you can actually, that, that nature is so weak that if justice is naturally good, uh, people can be educated to, uh, to, be, to, be, uh, to, uh, to not be able to see that. Okay, so, so one of the strengths of the, we, we won't actually get into it, uh, we, we won't actually get to this in this class, but one of the strengths of the, the argument that Socrates eventually makes, the definition of justice that he actually gives as a certain order of the soul, one of the questions that both of these speeches raise is, if justice is good, why do people choose to be unjust? I mean, the, the, the argument that Galcon presents is, well, if we really wanted to, to make the argument against justice, it would be that justice is naturally bad and injustice is naturally good. Uh, Adi Mantis, again, we saw has something uh, sort of the exact opposite. It says, well, uh, injust or the, the, the justice is good, but, but we have to kind of show this to people, otherwise they can't see it. But the question for both of them is, if justice is good, and that's what they both want to see proved, why are people unjust? How, how, well, if, if justice is this great good, this natural good, this good for the soul, why, why can people not see that? Why do they end up doing injustice? And the, the definition of justice that Socrates eventually suggests uh, in Book 4 uh, is that justice is a certain harmony of the soul. And one of the strengths of that, are, of that definition, of that picture of what justice is, is that it explains why people might, might not see justice as good. Because he says, you know, that there are different desires, different emotions in the soul, uh, sexual desire, sexual love, um, but also all kinds of other desires, and also anger. Uh, so, so people might be vengeful. In, in, in Glaucon's speech, the two great sources of injustice, uh, either you, you, you kill people because of ambition, because you want power, or maybe just for vengeance, and of course, you know, adultery. Uh, there is the other great thing that's going on in his speech. People are running around, everybody's sleeping with everybody else if they, if they can, if they can get away with it. Uh, and th these are the two things that if, if, they're not, if they're not properly ordered in the soul, and if they're not in particular, according to Socrates, the picture of the soul he eventually gives, if they don't obey reason, if the different desires, different emotions, anger, uh, desire, etc., if these things don't obey reason, then you have a situation where it's easy to see how somebody might choose to be unjust because it's, it's the emotions sort of running wild, making their own decisions, ignoring reason, but simply saying, "This is what I want. I want vengeance. I, I want. I want. You know, uh, uh, I want something over here that, that seems desirable to me, and I'm going to pursue that because, again, I'm not listening to reason. The desires are kind of making their own decisions, uh, uh, pursuing their own thing, and, and so that that explains then, you know, how do people mistake injustice as good if if it's actually not? Well, the idea is that you know, 
the desires themselves are not rational and you need to have reason ruling the soul in order to see what's good and therefore in order to see justice and to see justice as good. So again, one of the strengths of Socrates' eventual uh, definition of justice is that if, if justice is a certain order of the soul, then it's easy to, to see how people could be unjust. When their soul is, is disorderly, when their soul is out of order, when, when, when certain uh, uh, emotions or passions or desires are ruling in the soul instead of reason, then people pursue things that seem good to these desires, to these emotions, whether it's you know, d sexual desire, anger, different things like that. The soul pursues those things and it doesn't see clearly. So, so again, that, that, that's one of the strengths of the, uh, the uh, definition of justice, the picture of justice that Socrates eventually proposes. Um, going back to these two speeches, the, the differences that we see between Adiamantus and Glaucon, again, there are some clear similarities. Uh, but Glaucon is much more uh, focused on himself as an individual, and much more focused on the relationship between the individual and justice. Why should I, Glaucon, be just? How is justice good for me? How is justice good for the individual? Which is better for, for, for Glaucon? Which is better for the individual? Justice or injustice? Adiamantus is much more focused on society as a whole, on, on the influence of education, on society, the influence of education, especially on young people, and therefore on, on how that affects the city and the society as a whole. Uh, uh, Glaucon is very, very much focused on innovation. He again, he makes a, a does a much better job of using the using the, the concept of nature in his argument than Adiamantus does. As we just saw, Adiamantus says justice is naturally good, but then it's not clear why people would have trouble seeing that. Glaucon uses nature in a much better way. Injustice is naturally good. The law can force people to act against their interests using force, but it can never fool them about what's what's naturally good. It can never actually trick them into thinking that something that isn't naturally good is. Uh, so, so he understands this argument much better. He's very focused on these sort of innovative arguments uh, against justice, saying, you know, again, using the, using the, uh, the uh, distinction between nature and convention. Obviously, his speech was very violent. And people were being killed all over the place. It was very sexy. People were, you know, sleeping together, the, 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 uh, going after the queen and everything. Um, and he meant just much more focused on tradition, much more focused on, again, traditional education. Now, he's very critical, and in his own way, he's very radical. Uh, and as some of the notes point out, he's very radical of the sort of uh, religious poetic authorities he see at Homer. And there also seems to be criticism of, of, of official Athenian religion and in his criticism of, of some of the initiations, uh, some of the, the uh, religious rites that he criticizes. And this will be very important with, with at the end of book two, the Socrates and Adimantus begin to criticize uh, uh, the, the traditional sayings about the gods and suggest that they could be radically changed. And that continues through book three. So Adimantus' own concerns with, with education and his own you know, form of radicalism that, that he's willing to sort of rewrite uh, traditional Greek religion, this becomes very important. Uh, but unlike Glaucon, who's very much focused on the individual and very much focused on all kinds of uh, uh, innovative arguments against justice, Adimantus is much more uh, concerned with, with the community, with education, uh, and, and sort of with, with broader opinions about what justice is and how that affects people. Um, the other thing, obviously, Glaucon kind of ends his speech by saying, who's happier, the unjust man who gets all the, all the pleasant, all, all the good consequences of justice, or the unjust man who's being tortured to death? I mean, Glaucon very much wants to see that justice is worth great sacrifices. Adiamantus is sort of the opposite. He's sort, he's sort of saying, look, the whole problem is that we're telling people that justice requires all of these great sacrifices. What we should tell them is that it's like moderation. It's, it's, it's not that difficult. It, it's not this terrible question of self-denial. It's simply seeing what the good is and, and choosing it. Uh, again, you know, the, like, like the example with health. As, as you know, I mean, obviously you could say, well, if health is naturally good, why does, anybody, why does anybody choose sickness? Well, obviously they don't. Nobody is arguing that sickness is better than health, but people choose things that make them unhealthy. Uh, in the same way people might choose things that make them unjust, and Adi Manchester's argument is the problem is that we're telling them that it's so difficult, of course they're, they're, they're going to choose what seems easier. If we just told them that justice were something relatively simple, relatively easy, and, and good for them, then they would choose that, just like with health. If instead of focusing on how difficult exercise is and how, how unpleasant dieting is, if, if we focus on, hey, be healthy, it's not that bad, you're not really giving up that much, a little bit of moderation isn't that difficult, He's sort of arguing we should, we should present justice in the same way, as something that you basically choose because it's good and not that demanding, not that difficult. It, it, it's, again, it's, it's not requiring any great sacrifice. Glaucon wants to hear the opposite, that, that, that justice does require great sacrifices and that it's worth it, that, 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 you know, that devotion to justice requires this great heroism and that, again, that, 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 that's, that that's what it's there for. It's there to 
demand this great heroism, and, and that that's, that's what's good about it, is that it's so good that it's worth all of these great sacrifices. It's this great thing that's, that, that's, that's worth sacrificing really everything else for. So by the end of the speeches, uh, Socrates has a sort of uh, somewhat difficult uh, uh, task being set him where he's supposed to, to respond to both speeches and, and, and persuade both brothers of the goodness of justice, even though they both want to hear justice defended uh, in very different ways.